You know, most teams in the National Football League would love to go 11-5 and and make the playoffs, pitch a shutout in a road playoff game in the wild card round, and then be, you know, viable and competitive in a divisional playoff game again on the road against the defending Super Bowl champion New England Patriots. A lot of teams would take that season. A lot of teams would look at that and sit there and say, you know what, that's a great building block for the future. Man, we're excited about what's coming next. You know, this is a really good year, and it could be even better down the road. But then when we look at the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, you look at this team, and the best way I could put it, I'll, I'll make an NBA equivalent. To me, they're like the three or four seed in the playoffs that everybody respects and view as a good team. Maybe in some ways they go a little bit under the radar. And you think, you know, on the one hand, you really don't want to play them in the playoffs because they're well coached, they're a good balanced team. But then you really don't have that fear of them. And you know that ultimately, when they run up against a very good team or a great team, that they just don't have that right formula and they just don't have that right mix to get to that next level. And when I look at the Chiefs, that's what I see. I see a team that if they were in the NBA, they'd be a three or a four seed in the playoffs and you're like they're good but they're not great you know they're viable they're competitive they're respectable uh, you take them seriously but you don't take them that seriously and you don't view them as a threat to ever win a championship that's what they remind me and, and you know for the Chiefs you know Chiefs fans probably feel still pretty good about the season I'm sure the organization does and to be fair they have reasons too I mean you look at the Jeremy Macklin free agent signing you know he really uh, came through for him you know, had a 1,000-yard season, wide receiver that actually catch some touchdown passes. Imagine that. Travis Kelsey developed nicely in his third year. He had a nice, what I would call, breakout season. Offensively, a team you don't really think about in terms of being able to put up a bunch of points. They finished ninth in the league in points scored, sixth in the league in rushing yards, which is a particular impressive when you consider how much of the season they were without their star, their feature back, their stud, Jamal Charles. I mean, you're talking about a team that went 5-1 and one in the AFC West. They finally beat the Denver Broncos and Peyton Manning. I mean, you go 5-1, and one, you know, I think any team in the National Football League would want to go 5-1 and one in their division. You give them that, you say, hey, you go 5-1 and one in your division, they'll be like, I'll see you in the playoffs. You know, because first and foremost, the key to getting to the playoffs is handling your business within your division, and the Chiefs did that. And in a lot of ways, you could argue, based off of the first game with the Broncos and the way that all went down, they should have went 6-0 and oh in the division. Imagine how different their season would have been if they'd have done that. I mean, defensively, they ended up the year really, really good statistically. They were third in the league in points allowed, seventh in the league in yards allowed, a fourth in the league in sacks. So by the time all was said and done in the season, this was a tough defensive unit to play. They had nine games where they allowed 17 points or less. So you look at it and you're like, well, that's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good things. But, you know, I can't help but think that – this is a team getting by on a lot of smoke and mirrors. I mean, this is a team that started off the year 1-5, and five, and they won their last 10 games. And people thought, you know, they're playing the right way. They've got a great formula. This is going to equate to a lot of postseason success. Uh, when you look at that 10-game winning streak to close out the year, you know, ultimately you got to play who's scheduled. But let's look at the reality of the situation. They were playing a Pittsburgh Steelers team that was starting Landry Jones. They were playing a terrible Detroit Lions team at the time that was falling apart at the seams, and they were in London. They were playing a Denver Broncos team where Peyton Manning was at the height of his suck of this year and, you know, maybe played the worst game I've ever seen him play in two decades uh, between college and the NFL. He was that bad. Uh, they played San Diego twice, who have the third overall pick in this draft. They played Oakland twice, who's not as bad as San Diego, but they're still not a playoff team. Um, you know, you're talking about they played the Ravens, who have the sixth overall pick in the draft. They played the Browns, who have the number two overall pick in the draft. And then they played the Bills, another team that missed the playoffs. So out of those last 10 games of the season, eight of them came against non-playoff teams. And the two games that they did win against playoff teams in that stretch was a Pittsburgh Steelers team playing really with the third-string quarterback in Landry Jones and a terrible Peyton Manning. So it's kind of like, yeah, they won 10 games, but. Yeah, they won 11 games for the season, but. You know, this was a team that made it to the division round of the playoffs, but. It's always like there's a yeah, but with this team. I mean, it doesn't help, like I said, in terms of things that didn't go well. You lose Jamal Charles early on in the year to the knee injury. You know, that sucks because he's your best player. And to lose a guy like that that can impact the game both on the ground and in the air, you know, not too many teams can recover from that. And the Chiefs, I thought, did a good job the best they could. And it was ironic. They played a lot better once he went out with injury. But at the end of the day, at some point in time, that's going to catch up with you. Uh, you're talking about a team that really struggled to protect Alex Smith. I think they gave up like 45 sacks on the year. He, if you, it's one thing if you can rush the opposing team's quarterback, that's great. 
But if you can't protect your own quarterback, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So a guy who already struggles to stretch teams vertically down the field, if you're not giving him a lot of time to throw, you know, that limits the amount of time that he has to go through his progressions. That means he's going to do a lot of check downs. He's going to make a lot of short throws, meaning defense is kind of, kind of sagging. And you're lacking for big plays on the offensive side of the ball. Well, the Denver loss in week two on Thursday night was really bad. I mean, that was just another example of horrible game management by Andy Reid in the catalog of a career full of them, which is a shame because he's such a good coach in so many other ways. But he's so terrible when it comes to game management, time management, clock management. It's atrocious. Why the hell are you handing off the ball to Jamal Charles in that situation? Just take the knee, go to overtime, and take your chances there. And then the loss to Chicago. You can't lose to the Chicago Bears. You're supposed to be a superior team to them. You have no business losing to them. When you think about it, you know, how much differently does the entire season play out for the Chiefs if they beat the Chicago Bears? They're a 12-4 and team. Maybe they win the division. You know if they beat Chicago and they find a way to win in overtime against the Broncos in Week 2, they're 13-3. and Not only are they winning the division, you're talking about a team that has the number one overall seed in the AFC playoffs, and then, who knows, all bets are off. You know, so it's... The 1-5 and five start was bad, but when you look at it, they played some good teams like Denver and Green Bay and Cincinnati and Minnesota. Those are all teams that made the playoffs. You know, So it's not the worst thing in the world. It was that Chicago loss in particular that was really, really bad, though. You know, And ultimately, again, when I come to this organization, at the end of the day, there are two things that really hold them back. It's really bad clock management and game management by Andy Reid, and I just don't understand how this guy doesn't get it after all these years. He sucks at it. So many other things he does so well, and he's so terrible at this. And I also come back to their quarterback situation. It's been over three decades since this team spent a first-round pick on a quarterback, and even back then in 83, it was Todd Blackledge. Oops. You missed out on Jim Kelly. You missed out on Dan Marino, for Christ's sake. You even missed out <laughs> Ken O'Brien, for God's sake. Um, you're not going to get anywhere with Alex Smith. You're just not a championship contending team with Alex Smith. He doesn't produce enough of big plays, he plays too close to the vest, and he doesn't have nearly the arm strength to be able to stretch teams down the field vertically enough to introduce the big play element that you sometimes need in your offense. Alex Smith is the epitome of a game manager in today's NFL. You're just not going to win championships with a game manager. For those that say the Denver Broncos won uh, Super Bowl 50 with Peyton Manning as a game manager, you're a fucking idiot. He wasn't managing anything. I mean, they played and won in spite of their quarterback. Because even for a game manager, a game manager doesn't have two turnovers in the biggest game of the year. That's not a game manager. He was terrible. You know, Alex Smith manages the game, sure, but when it's all on the line, is he going to produce those big plays? Is he going to lead you over the hump? Is he going to be able to take a team on his back? No. He's a guy that you win games with. He's not a guy you win a lot of games because, and in particular, you don't win big games because of him. And at the end of the day, until the Kansas City Chiefs, and this is why I allude to back a few years ago when I talked about them trading for Alex Smith and giving up the two second round picks. I even talked about it back then. I'm like, you know, this team will get to the playoffs with him probably in his first year there, and people are going to be fooled into thinking this was a good move, and it wasn't because at the end of the day, what happens is the Kansas City Chiefs are who they are, and they're not going to go any further than what they are until they find a better answer at quarterback, a guy with a stronger arm that can make more big plays. It's that simple. When you point to the draft, that's their number one need. It's quarterback. And I don't mean to make this just an Alex Smith bash piece, but Jesus Christ, you know, at some point in time, we've got to be, you got to be honest. you got to sit there and say, are you really going to win a championship with this guy? And the answer is a most unequivocal no. Now, where they're picking at 25, is there going to be a quarterback available worth taking with that pick? Probably not. Is this an organization that's going to be in a huge urgency to move a few spots up on the board to potentially take one? Probably not. You know, they'll focus on positions like offensive tackle where they need a lot of help because Fisher looks like a bust, the former number one overall pick in 2013. They gave Jay, Jai Reed a bunch of money for God knows what reason. They still could use some help at wide receiver. You know, Chris Conley is an athletic project, but he's a project nonetheless. You know, they could use another better compliment to Jeremy Macklin on the outside, even though at the end of the day you wonder really how much that actually matters with Alex Smith throwing the ball. You know, he's not going to get that much out of them down the field in the vertical passing game anyways. Defensively, they could use some depth in the back portion of that defense. You could also say they could use some uh, talent on that front end that of that 3-4 defense. They could use some help on the defensive line, especially with a couple free agents there. You know, Derek Johnson at the inside linebacker position um, is one of these things where how much longer is he going to play? You've got a couple of safeties that are free agents. Even if you retain, let's say, an Eric Berry, you're probably going to need one there. And the Chiefs are in, a, in an odd spot here because 
they can focus on other areas. They can get some good players, and they can get better as a team. Uh, but it won't necessarily reflect in the record. And at the end of the day, until they find that long-term answer at quarterback, it's not going to matter. It's just that simple. Do you really look honestly at the Kansas City Chiefs and view them as being a championship contender? And in any way, shape, or form, can you envision a path where this team could be a championship contender with Alex Smith as their starting quarterback? I just don't see it. And I know you probably don't see it. I'm sure Chiefs fans, whether they want to admit it or not, they know they don't see it. It's just a question of if this organization is going to wake up and see it themselves.